One of the things I really love about physics is that you learn tools throughout your introduction to physics course, and those tools don't really really ever go away. They're always there for you to go back to your toolbox of physics stuff and see if you can use them. And then you can get new tools and you can use those tools together. And that's a long rambly way to say, we're gonna go back to some, some old ideas and we're gonna tie them to some brand new ideas when it, when it concerns rotation. But before we go to do the new ideas, we have to review this really old idea from back at the beginning of our course, is that we can solve some questions using forces and kinematics, or we can solve that same question using energy. And some people have a preference toward, hey, you know what, I like to sum my forces, solve for acceleration, then once I know the acceleration, then I can go back to kinematics right here. And some people really like that because they're very strong with forces and kinematics. And remember, once you're in kinematics land, finding time is always helpful. Some people say, hey, you know what, energy? It actually takes a few less steps. I actually like that tool better. Well, before we go do the new, new stuff, because in a couple minutes we're gonna take this, these ideas and we're gonna tie them into rotation, let's just review this old stuff just to kind of get it back in our brains. So here's the setup. You have a block on a ramp. You have a block on a ramp. We're gonna do the forces and kinematics on the left-hand side here. And then we're gonna do the energy way on the right-hand side here just to review. So physics never goes away. We just get stronger and stronger and we get more and more tools in our toolbox. So think about this. Step one, when you do a forces question, you draw a picture. Step two, you label your forces. Step three, you have to pick your coordinate system. And it makes sense in this case, since we have a ramp, we're gonna tilt our x-axis right parallel with the ramp. And this would be our y-axis, just like that. So picture, forces, coordinate system. And then step four, we have to sum our forces. Now, just to keep it nice, we're not gonna have any friction on our ramp today. We're just gonna say it's a block. We have gravity going straight down. And remember, this is theta right here, which means this is theta in our triangle right there. Those are similar triangles. This theta right here is that theta right there. And the opposite side of the triangle here, that's force gravity in the X, because that's going down the ramp in your X direction. Force gravity in the Y is this part that's the adjacent part right there. And then we have the normal force, which is perpendicular to the ramp. So the ramp's like this, and the normal force is perpendicular to the ramp. And remember, technically the normal force happens at the bottom of the block with the ramp right there, because it's a result of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. Sometimes I get a little lazy and I drop right there just because I don't like to put it down where it's touching the surface right there, just because it kind of clutters up my diagram. So we're gonna do the forces way right now. So we're on step four. We're gonna sum our forces. And we have this right here. Sum your forces in the X. And remember, if our goal is to figure out how fast this block is going at the end right there, well, we're, we're in forces land right now. We're summing forces, and we wanna get to kinematics land. And our link between forces and kinematics, you have to solve for the net acceleration, because that's gonna help you get over to kinematics, all right? So we sum our forces, and we say, hey, this force gravity in the X, remember, force gravity is the mg, that's the hypotenuse of your triangle, and you don't get all of gravity bring you down the ramp, you just get this opposite side of the triangle right there. And we've actually reasoned this out in different videos how it works out, but if you wanna take a shortcut in thinking here, you don't get all of gravity, you just get the opposite side that's helping you break down. So we say, there's all of gravity, mg, and you're just picking out that opposite side, which is actually the part of the gravitational force that's bringing you down the ramp in the x direction. And you say, hey, since there's no friction, there's no force going back that way, and there's no rope pulling the block down the ramp, so we don't have any other forces to add up here on this left-hand side of the equation. So Newton's second law says, whatever F you have, your net force is equal to M times A. So we said equal to MA. And something sweet happens, your masses cancel. And we realize things accelerate down ramps like this, and it's independent of their mass. So the Ms go by by here, it's just G sine of theta. So we're happy, we're like, okay, Let's assume this block started from rest. Let's just say V initially equals well, zero meters per second. Meters per second, that's really bad handwriting. And we're gonna say, let's figure out how fast it's going at the end of the ramp and the distance of the ramp down the ramp is distance lowercase d, okay? So we're like, okay, we need a kinematics equation that involves our givens right here. V initial, we know, we're looking for V final. We know the acceleration and we know the distance of the ramp delta x is equal to d. So we, we don't have time. So the only kinematics equation that makes sense that we don't have time is this one right here. We say, hey, we know the initial velocity, the block started from rest. We know the number two is just a constant in the equation right there. We acceleration, you just got it right there. And we know it's gonna slide down the ramp a distance of D. Some people get confused, they're like, oh, delta X, is it is it the height right there? No, no, your axis, your X axis, is this delta X, that's distance D, that's what's gonna go right there, all right? Now, be mindful is that this equation, you have squares in there, so if you ever had a negative, it'll square out, so just, if. I define the positive direction as down the ramp, so that's gonna be positive anyway. There are no negatives, but just something to consider. So I plug in what I know, and I have this right here, and I go down there, and I take the square root, and you get the velocity at the end of the ramp is the square root of two 
times gravity times the distance down the ramp times the sine of the, the angle right there. So we did it. We got forces. We solved for net acceleration. Once we had net acceleration, we went over kinematics and we solved for V final. And that makes us happy. And it is positive velocity because we said positive was down the ramp and that is definitely the way the block moved. Okay. And now just to review, we can do it forces way or we can go over here energy way. We say, hey, you know what? Since there is no friction, and you make the decision. Like, do you think this is easier? Um, this is a little more hands-on, like you have to like do the steps in between. At the end, all your PE converts over to KE because your height is zero at the bottom of the ramp right here. I, I can even say, hey, hey, height equals zero. I have no more potential. All right. So at the very end, all my energy is in the kinetic form. Now you can already see, I'm already got a V in my equation. It took me a couple steps to get down any velocities here. And I started at a height of H, so I had initial potential energy of MGH. So all my PE, and we said I was at rest, so just had potential energy here. If it was moving up there, you could have PE plus KE, but let's not do that right now. So all your PE converts over to KE, and you just saw this for VF. And you get VF equals square root of two GH. And you're like, well, that is not that. And you have to take a little brief pause and you say, hey, let's get the height out of there. Let's get in terms of the theta and the distance right there. And we know in our triangle, the sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So we say, oh, sine of theta is h over d. And you just say, hey, you know what? That makes h equal to times the d over. h equals d sine of theta. And then you just make that substitution. This is not wrong, by the way. It's just that our answer over here was in terms of the distance down the ramp. It's a little trigonometry right here. And so you're like, hey, you know what? h equals d sine of theta. You make that substitution. And lo and behold, you get the same answer. Kind of cool. I'll be honest, I like both ways. I'm a physics teacher. I, this way is cool, it involves you know two units, unit one kinematics, unit two forces. This way is cool because it involves unit three, which was energy. And I'll say it's equal to zero joules, again, because remember we said there's no friction on our system, so EI will equal EF. But um, either which way works. So you get the same answer, different tools, but now we have to relate that to rotational motion, and that's where it'll be a little more fun, okay? I will say this, just to kind of set this up, the energy method for rotation is going to be a lot easier. And I'm just putting that in your mind right now, just because this takes more steps here. When it's going to take even more steps because we have to involve torque. So, all right, we're going to look at it with, in terms of rotation. So we're still going to say, all right, force is kinematics and now torques, because remember, it's rotating, so we're going to have to involve torques versus energy. So just pointing this out, forces and kinematics versus energy was what we just did. But now that it's rotating, we have to involve torques versus the energy method. Now technically the energy method, you have rotational kinetic energy, but still, this is gonna be a lot easier. So let's say you have a solid hoop with just enough friction to make it roll, but not slide. Because can you picture if you had a hoop going down a ramp, if there was no friction, it'd just be like really slick ice, it'd just slide down without rotating. So there's just enough friction to make it roll, but we're still gonna be able to assume EF minus EI equals zero joules. We're gonna say there's not enough friction to steal a significant amount of energy away from the system. You have, instead of a block, now you have a hoop. All the mass is concentrated on the outside of the hoop here. And it's different than a disc because a disc is solid right there. So your moment of inertia of a hoop is mR squared. It's got a larger moment of inertia than a disc because the mass is farther out, okay? So we have the situation right here. And you can picture, as this hoop rolls down the ramp, it's gonna start spinning, it's gonna start rotating. Now, step one, you draw a picture. Step two, you label your forces. So you still have force gravity, Fg. Now, they said something very important. They said there's enough friction, and because this surface is touching that surface, there's enough friction to make it roll. So the, as this thing wants to slide down the ramp, the force of friction says, hey, I don't want you to slide down the ramp. I'm gonna fight you to going up the ramp. But that's the force right there. That's causing a torque. The force of gravity is acting from the center of the object. And remember, when you have forces acting on the center, this force of gravity does not cause the object to rotate, right? Because in order to have a torque, you have to apply a force at a radius. And so this force friction right here is providing the torque. Gravity is not. And then the third force right here, you have the normal force, which is between these two surfaces. I'm just going to draw it straight, right? Like this, Fn. And Fn, as well, is not providing a torque on this wheel because, and I'll call it a wheel or a hoop, because Fn is in line with the radius. So the angle between that force and the radius is zero degrees. The sine is zero, is zero. So the only force causing this wheel to rotate is the force of friction, because you can picture, here's your lever arm, your R is right here. Force of friction is right there acting, you know, tangent to that, 90 degrees. So that's the force of friction causing a torque as the wheel rolls down, rolls down the ramp, all right? So step one, we drew a picture. Step two, we label our forces. Step three, we're gonna pick our coordinate system and it's just our standard one, just like we just did. So we'll do a little X, a little Y, just like that. 
And then step four, we're gonna sum our forces, but we also have to sum our torques because it's not just like a block, it's not just going down the ramp, so it's not just forces, it's also rotating, so we have to take into account there's a torque on the wheel. So we're gonna start with this right now, we're gonna sum our forces. And I'm kind of jumping steps here, but we have the force of gravity in the x direction again. So if you want to break this into, we just reviewed this, but you say, hey, we don't get all the force of gravity. This is mg, this is the hypotenuse right there. That's your y part, this is your x part, that's your angle theta right there. And so this is the force of gravity in the x, force of gravity in the x. That's what's bringing it down the ramp, mg sine, it's the opposite side. And this is fgy right here. I don't want to clear up my diagram, it got a little small. But here's the deal. Force gravity in the x, mg times the sine is what's bringing it down the ramp. And you can see force friction is going up the ramp, so that's minus ff. So those are your two forces, and you can see my coordinate system is lined up with the ramp. This pink force is parallel to the ramp, ff is lined up with the ramp. So we have two forces in the x direction, and Newton said f equals m times a, so that's exactly what we did. Now here's the bummer. The mass is m, g, the angle they could tell you, but we don't know anything about this force or friction. So that's a question mark, that's an unknown. We don't know anything about the acceleration. Remember the big deal is if we wanna figure out how fast this thing's going by the end of the ramp, we gotta say, hey, how fast is it going by the end of the ramp? We have to know that acceleration. And this is the acceleration of the hoop down the ramp. It's not talking about angular acceleration. It's about how, how many meters per second squared does it cover down the ramp. So the bummer is we have one equation with two unknowns. And I will say this, let's not explore the y direction a ton because what's gonna happen is if you look at this and just in the interest of time, you're like, oh, Fn minus mg cosine, like we were used to. You come down here and you're like, oh, force friction, we don't know. We don't know mu. So that actually doesn't even help us. The y direction doesn't even help us when you go to do this like it normally would. So once you explore your forces, the only option you have left to do is to explore torques. And so that's what we're gonna do right here. So you say, all right, why is this wheel rotating or this hoop? Why is it rotating? Well, it's because it's going down the ramp, but as this goes down, there's gravity, the X component of gravity brings it down the ramp. That's not causing a torque. What's causing a torque is this force being applied tangentially to the hoop right there. And so as it goes down the ramp, that force is acting at a radius right there and it's causing a torque on the wheel there. So we have, okay, there is one torque on this wheel. It's the force of friction times R because it's acting, if this is the center of the hoop and that's where it's acting, that's R right there, the radius of the hoop, times the sine of the angle between your force friction and your radius right there. Now, here's the deal. Your force friction's going that way. Your R is that way. Sine of 90, it's 90 degrees right there because it's touching it right there. Tangent is one. So that's gonna simplify quite nicely. And remember, Newton said F equals MA, and the analog to that in rotation is torque equals I alpha because F becomes torque, tau, M's become moments of inertia I and A's become alphas. Remember, alpha is angular acceleration. So here's the deal. We've been doing a lot of work and we may actually have to speed this up, but I'll say, all right, you figure out, okay, the force of friction equals I times alpha, okay? And you're like, so we get the FF, we can plug that in there and it's gonna take you a second. And I said buckle up right here because this solution is done. I'm gonna come back and do that very quickly, but we still have to keep going. And if this is the part of the video where you're like, you know what, Mr. Lauren, I'm just gonna trust you, the energy method's way easier. You can fast forward to the energy method and call it good, but um, this is probably good to know. So we have some things we know. We have our equation number one, which is the sum of the force in the X, and we have equation three, which got us the force friction equals I alpha over R. But here's the deal. In this equation right here, we have an A. In this equation here, we have an alpha, and we have to kind of get these related to each other so we can get them speaking on the same terms. So you remember back in the day, arc length equals r theta. We've used that a little bit. We've used this quite a bit. Tangential velocity equals r times omega. And if you ever want to remember it this way, that's arc length. We take the derivative, we get velocity. You take the derivative of velocity, you get acceleration. Here, this is radians. You take the derivative of radians per, with respect to time, you get radians per second, which is angular velocity. You take the derivative of angular velocity, you get angular acceleration. So when I do this, I really just remember s equals r theta, and it's derivative, 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 the r is just a constant. But here's the deal. You're like, you know what? This torque equation we were dealing with seemed pretty helpful, but it had an alpha in there. And I don't wanna have an alpha in there because I introduced another variable, so we gotta get the alpha out of there. But you know alpha equals your acceleration as to rearrange this one over the r, okay? So I'm gonna use that fact just to kinda of get the alpha out of there and kinda of simplify that torque equation.